What we know for certain is that at some point in the early 21st century, we marveled at our own magnificence as we gave birth to AI. And then, we mostly just used it to plagiarize art. That's what this episode's about. This episode is brought to you by Nebula, where you can watch the bonus companion video right now. Buongiorno. Patrick, you're back. How was the premiere? It was incredible. I walked the red carpet, mingled with the stars. It was a true Roman holiday, and I was Audrey Hepburn. Not Gregory Peck? Nope. Rome was invigorating. The history, the culture, the spaghetti. And I'm ready to bring this sun-kissed energy to today's episode in pursuit of Cruz, her suit. A definitive ranking of Tom Cruise's hairstyles. It's perfect timing. YouTube's been feeling really hollow lately. Must be all these AI Wes Anderson parodies. People are making Wes Anderson parodies? I did that years ago. Yeah, in my younger days, I studied Wes Anderson's whole style, wrote a script, made costumes. My friends and I shot it all over the city. I mean, it took months of work, but we have memories that'll last a lifetime. Well, people aren't making them making them. They're just getting AI to do all the stuff you just said. Oh, hey, you're back from Italy. What are you guys up to? Ciao, Dave. I'm just showing Patrick how people are using AI to create videos, ostensibly rendering la, 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 our careers obsolete. Wait a second, let me see this. What is this? Don't people understand this isn't real filmmaking? Okay, Emma, we're bumping the Tom Cruise hair video. This is what today's episode is gonna be about. Yeah. These lazy AI bums need to be taken to task. We can come crashing down on them like the vengeful fist of an unforgiving ancient god, laying waste to all non-believers. Their screams will be the cacophonous motif to your ascension on a throne made of their skulls. Fig Newton? Just like the fresh figs of old Italia. Molto bene. We're gonna need you to get that all out of your system before you get in front of a camera. See. Folks, we did it. We pulled off Mission Impatsible. I went to Rome. I attended the Dead Reckoning Part 1 world premiere. Everything is going great. And then I got back home and saw some stuff that annoyed me so much that I just have to make a video about it. And look, if you watch this show, you know that I mostly stick to talking about things that I like. I hate being a bummer, so that's how you know this is a big deal. Patrick. There's still time to pivot back to the video about Tom Cruise's hair. That can wait, Emma. This is more important. So over the past year, there has been an explosion of AI-generated art. And I'm putting art in quotation marks here. Using tools like Midjourney and ChatGPT, now all one has to do is type in some prompts, and in no time at all, the programs will auto-generate shockingly detailed and realistic imagery, writing, audio, and animation. Now, you no longer need any talent, skill, practice, or education to produce art that looks like it was created by professionals. 
Some of the AI art that has garnered the most attention, going viral multiple times in the last six months, are imitations of the work of Wes Anderson, imagining what various franchises might look like if directed by him. This started with a handful of images visualizing a theoretical Wes Anderson take on the Avengers that really blew up when enthusiastically shared by those lovable scamps, the Russo brothers. But it really kicked into another gear in April, when a company called Curious Refuge released a series of videos imagining Wes Anderson-directed versions of Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, and Avatar. Since then, there have been countless imitators that haven't quite achieved the same degree of viral success. Wes Anderson versions of Harry Potter, and Jurassic Park, and Spider-Man, and Justice League, and Hunger Games, and multiple versions of The Matrix. Just a few days ago, Instagram recommended me a series of AI-generated images imagining a Wes Anderson version of Succession. And come on guys, that has existed for 20 years and it's called the Royal Tenenbaums. Part of why I wanted to talk about this is that I sort of have a special connection to the subject of Wes Anderson parody trailers. Back in 2015, I released a video called What If Wes Anderson Directed X-Men, which honestly still might be the thing I'm best known for. It's kind of the same general idea as these new AI videos, except that I spent months working on it with my actual human friends instead of having a computer make it in a day. And to be clear, I wasn't even the first person to make a What If Wes Anderson Directed video. Jeff Loveness, writer of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, made Wes Anderson Anderson's Spider-Man all the way back in 2010. So anyway, on the one hand, I'm looking at these new Wes Anderson videos going, uh, guys, we did this years ago. It's over. But even despite the been there, done that aspect, there's a lot more that bothers me about them. I can already hear some people saying now, hey man, these are just some fun YouTube videos where people are playing around with some new toys. Why are you making a whole video about this instead of talking about real movies? Well, hypothetical straw man, I'm making a whole video about it because what right now seems like just some tech curious people playing around with new tools could actually be the beginning of a very serious shift that will affect real movies. Actually, I'm willing to bet that by the time I finish writing this essay, enough new evidence will have appeared to confirm that, yeah, AI art is affecting way more than just YouTube videos, and not in a good way. Before we get into the videos themselves, we have to answer the question, why Wes Anderson? Why do people keep parodying him more than any other filmmaker? Why did I do it in the first place? Well, in my case, I actually had a whole series of videos on this channel imagining what various superhero movies would look like if made by directors ranging from Sergio Leone to Ingmar Bergman to Noah Baumbach to Werner Herzog. But I totally understand why the Wes Anderson one was the most successful. Anderson straddles the line between art house and mainstream. Even if his movies don't do blockbuster-level box office, even the most casual moviegoers are familiar with him and understand what his movies look and feel like. There's probably no other filmmaker working today with such an immediately identifiable style. Like sure, Spielberg and Scorsese are more famous, but ask a random person to describe what one of their movies looks like and you're not going to get a clear answer. But everyone knows what a Wes Anderson movie looks like. You can spot it a hundred yards away. It's ripe for parody because there's a set of characteristics that apply to just about every film he's made. We're talking about symmetrical framing, static shots, camera movement, either parallel or perpendicular to the action, almost always on a dolly, Bill Murray, flat backgrounds, the camera almost always at eye level, warm color palette leaning into yellowish hues, Owen Wilson, dry subdued performances from the actors, perfectly tailored clothing, insert shots of books and objects shot from straight overhead, Jason Schwartz, handmade analog filmmaking and technology, stop motion animation. Anyway, you get the idea. Because the characteristics are relatively simple, they can be imitated pretty easily with little to no budget. You can see this on display in the recent TikTok trend of My Day But Make It Wes Anderson, where people just shoot a montage of an average day in their life, but with the visual tropes of a Wes Anderson movie. 
Which brings us to the AI versions. As I mentioned earlier, the whole AI Wes Anderson thing began with those Avengers images late last year. And honestly, even aside from how they were made, I think these are pretty weak. They don't even have the framing or lighting of a Wes Anderson movie. Like, plenty of people doing fan art over the years have done it way better. But the main thing I want to focus on here are the videos produced by Curious Refuge. Star Wars by Wes Anderson, Lord of the Rings by Wes Anderson, and Avatar by Wes Anderson. All three released within the span of a month. Before this, the company Curious Refuge wasn't in the business of narrative storytelling at all. Welcome to Curious Refuge. This channel is going to be super random, but that's exactly the way it should be. They made tutorials about Adobe After Effects and other software. They had a course called The Curious Millionaire that taught how to make money as an entrepreneur. And then, one day, they released the Star Wars by Wes Anderson video, which I gotta say, delivers on its premise a lot better than that Avengers stuff. It has the framing, it has the cast of actors, even if the person they claim is Scarlett Johansson looks like Millie Bobby Brown instead. But overall, yeah, sure, that looks like a Wes Anderson Star Wars. The video went viral, and in the YouTube comments section at least, got an extremely positive reaction. Curious Refuge immediately changed their entire business to focus on AI filmmaking, and they currently have an AI filmmaking course available for the low, low price of $500. Positive YouTube comments? A sure sign of trouble to come. In an interview, Curious Refuge co-founder Caleb Ward, the guy who... Uh, made these videos, broke down in detail how they were put together. It turns out, he didn't even come up with the idea himself. He asked ChatGPT to give him a list of potential viral YouTube videos, and one of the ideas it generated was Wes Anderson's Star Wars. We used AI to come up with the idea for the video. I basically went to ChatGPT and I was like, give me some ideas that people might enjoy. And it came up with a bunch of ideas, and Star Wars by Wes Anderson was one of them, and I, in, instantly I was like, oh yeah, that, I think that would do well. ChatGPT also wrote the script and generated the shot list. Then Midjourney was used to create the shots, with human animation added by DID and narration by Eleven Labs. The only actual human element in the entire thing came from refining the images and adding some subtle animation to make the still images seem like live action. Part of the reason Wes Anderson has become the go-to filmmaker for AI users to imitate is that his visual style works with the limitations of AI. Right now, AI animation software capable of creating complex movement isn't widely available to the public and also looks pretty janky, so most people are working with Midjourney, which only creates still images. But since Wes Anderson's movies are full of static shots of people posed carefully in the center of the frame, his style can be replicated fairly accurately. So true. If they really wanted to impress us, they'd do Oliver Stone's Star Wars or Tony Scott's The Avengers. Look, I'll admit I came in here pretty skeptical about this whole AI thing, but I try to give everything a fair shake. And I always like to do my research so I hopefully know what I'm talking about. So I decided to try an experiment. Since the Curious Refuge dude gave a full breakdown of his process for making one of these videos, I thought, hey, maybe I should use that same process to make one of my own. And I'll use it to make a Wes Anderson X-Men. I already did this the difficult old-fashioned way, so let's see how this new version compares. Did this feel weird? Yup. Am I using tools that are ethically pretty questionable? Yup. Is this hopefully in service of the greater good and therefore justifies my actions? I hope so. So anyway, here's what I did. First, I went to ChatGPT and gave it the prompt, script for an X-Men movie trailer directed by Wes Anderson. Then I instructed ChatGPT to turn that script into a shot list. Then I spent a few minutes learning how to use Midjourney to get the right results. Turns out, Midjourney works through a Discord server. Weird. Anyway, then I used Midjourney to create each of the shots on the shot list. Then I ran those through DID to make the people move a little bit. And finally, I used Eleven Labs to generate the narration. And so, here it is. My AI-generated Wes Anderson X-Men.
in a world where mutants live among us, meet the X-Men, an extraordinary group of individuals, led by Professor Xavier, the master of the mind, Jean Grey, the guardian of all things fragile, Quicksilver, the fastest thing on Earth, at least for now, Rogue, the one who steals life's hues, but when a sinister force threatens to tear their world apart, Magneto, the master of magnetism, will stop at nothing to achieve his vision. In a world of chaos, they'll discover the strength of their bonds and the power of their differences. This summer, witness the extraordinary world of the X-Men, as reimagined by Wes Anderson. Starring Bill Murray as Professor X, Tilda Swinton as Jean Grey, Owen Wilson as Quicksilver, Cierce Ronan as Rogue, Adrian Brody as Nightcrawler, Jason Schwartzman as Gambit, and Ralph Fiennes as Magneto. X-Men Asymmetrical Harmony. Okay, so after spending a whole day of my life making that, I have to say, it sucks. Like that is a bad video. And I don't just mean it sucks because Midjourney is awful at group shots and some of the faces are kind of fucked up. Like if that's your argument against AI, you are missing the forest for the trees because the truth is this AI stuff is rapidly improving and those issues will be fixed soon. Like remember when we all laughed at the weird hands with too many fingers and now, hey, they took care of all that. And if we want to nitpick, there are also easy things to complain about. Like where did they get that X-Men team? There's no Cyclops, or Wolverine, or Storm, and yet Quicksilver makes the cut? This is an embarrassing mistake for AI, but it is a great win for Quicksilver. Like a real Cinderella story, like a 16th seed winning March Madness. Good for you, Pietro. But look, the real problem here is that this doesn't even feel like a Wes Anderson movie or even a trailer for a Wes Anderson movie. Like the title, X-Men Asymmetrical Harmony? That sounds more like a prog rock album than a Wes Anderson movie. His titles are always to the point, like the name of the setting of the film. Asteroid City, The Darjeeling Limited, I Love Dogs, The Grand Budapest Hotel. It's the same thing with these other videos, like The Galactic Menagerie, The Whimsical Fellowship. What is this? These aren't imitating Wes Anderson movies. They are imitating the 2013 SNL Wes Anderson parody. The Midnight Coterie of Sinister Intruders. And the thing about that parody is that it had narration by Alec Baldwin, which was a riff on the Royal Tenenbaums, which Alec Baldwin also narrated. Royal Tenenbaum bought the house on Archer Avenue in the winter of his 35th year. And so, all of these AI parodies also have narrators, despite the fact that A, they don't sound like Alec Baldwin, and B, none of the actual trailers for Wes Anderson's real movies have narration. So if you don't have Alec Baldwin, there's no joke, and it's just an inaccurate imitation. These videos reduce Wes Anderson to an Instagram filter, a checklist of style tropes to be pasted onto something. There is no effort to engage with his work on a deeper level than just skimming through some trailers with no sound. For one thing, despite what AI would have you believe, his movies do not consist entirely of static shots with the same framing. From the very beginning, his work has been incredibly kinetic. There are the epic slow motion dolly shots, the sparingly used chaotic handheld shots. His stop motion work has even more energy as the camera tracks perfectly alongside characters running and flipping and dancing through scenes. Wes Anderson movies have action scenes. Why do people forget this? And while he's had a consistent aesthetic baseline through his entire filmography, it has evolved over time. The French Dispatch looks wildly different from Rushmore, and depending on the film, he'll use different aspect ratios and film stocks and color palettes. None of these AI videos bother to get into the actual stories of these hypothetical movies. They deliver the basic premise of the original film, but do nothing with how Anderson might approach it. There are no scenes, or dialogue, or relationships between the characters. The thing that annoys me the most about these videos is that they completely ignore the humanity of his movies, which is as important, if not more so, than the aesthetics. See, while all Wes Anderson's movies are fun, they're also all sad. Nearly every one of his movies is about people dealing with grief in some way. 
At the start of his latest film, Asteroid City, Jason Schwartzman's character is struggling to figure out how to break the news to his children that their mother has died. The Darjeeling Limited is about three brothers processing the recent death of their father. The Life Aquatic is about a man seeking revenge for the death of his best friend, and along the way he meets his estranged son, who, spoilers, also dies. Almost every one of his movies is about people who are broken in some way or another, finding some kind of meaning or purpose or belonging in a unique location or community. In Asteroid City, it happens when the characters are quarantined in a small desert town. In the Grand Budapest Hotel, a young refugee finds his purpose under the tutelage of an eccentric hotel concierge. In the French Dispatch, it's the collection of writers for the titular magazine. In The Life Aquatic, it's the boat. In The Royal Tenenbaums, a dysfunctional family reunites in their childhood home to try to mend their many emotional wounds. The thing is, if these AI parodies were actually any good, and they wanted to put in any effort, they could absolutely embrace those themes. Like, for example, in the Star Wars one, they could have Luke Skywalker grieving the deaths of his aunt and uncle, and finding a new purpose on board the Millennium Falcon with this eccentric group of rebels. Lord of the Rings is already about a strange collection of people on a potentially doomed quest, like the Life Aquatic. There are difficult group dynamics and tension, everyone's dealing with their own shit. You could have, like, I don't know, Gandalf as the emotionally manipulative leader who gets angry and takes it out on the group when Gladriel won't sleep with him. But none of that is in the AI versions. These are unable to probe any deeper than going, Bill Murray is in Wes Anderson movies and he's an old man. Gandalf is an old man, so here, nightmarishly, is Bill Murray's face pasted on Gandalf's head. Also, there's this really important fact that everyone keeps overlooking, which is that Wes Anderson makes comedies. She's been murdered, and you think I did it. Hey! And none of these videos are remotely funny. Like, there are zero jokes. It sucks. I mean, artificial intelligence, more like shard official into my pants. That sucked. Yes, Emma, it did suck. But it sucked in a way that only a human could suck. As I've mentioned already, I've made a Wes Anderson parody before. And I'm not saying there's only one correct way to do it. I'm not even saying mine is amazing. There's a lot I'd do differently now. But I do think that mine is pretty solid. So here is how I tried to do it years before using AI was even an option. My goal with the video was for it to be less of a parody and more like a filmmaking exercise. I didn't want to do what that SNL video had done and just plug in characters and moments from his other movies into a new context. I tried to do my best take on how I thought Anderson might actually approach that material. I picked X-Men because, in a lot of ways, it already was a Wes Anderson movie. It was a group of brilliant teens, or gifted youngsters, living in an elaborately decorated mansion with an emotionally distant father figure, and they all wear coordinated yellow and blue jumpsuits. Like, that is all just a part of the original premise. And making this video did not just take a couple of days. First, I went through and rewatched all of Anderson's movies, taking notes on recurring themes and types of characters and relationships. The idea was to go deeper than just a checklist of stylistic elements. And wow, I am really sorry if this sounds way too pretentious for a silly YouTube video, but what I'm getting at is I put a lot of effort into it. Anyway, since Anderson obviously has a fondness for media from the 1960s, I went back and used the original core X-Men team from 1963. Big sci-fi action isn't really his thing, so I thought it made sense to have Magneto be a pretentious author who's like an intellectual rival of Professor X. We built a scale cross-section model of the mansion so we could add the characters in with green screens and have these shots like in The Life Aquatic. Oh, and our real secret weapon was that we used the actual Royal Tenenbaum's house, because at the time I lived like five minutes away in Harlem. So the point of all this was to study a filmmaker that I love, and actually try to figure out, to the best of my abilities, okay, how would he actually make this movie? And then, of course, the other point was to have fun with my friends. This whole thing was a big collaboration. 
My friend Kendra made the uniforms and also played Storm. My sister supervised the rest of the costumes, and we had a big day finding all the pieces at various thrift stores. My friend Zack played Wolverine, and his brother Ben built the model for us. And then the usual crew, including original Chloe and dearly departed Jake, played the rest of the characters. We had a couple of fun, frantic weekends running all over New York City filming it. And if you'll allow me to get sentimental for a minute, part of what depresses me about these AI videos is that they might discourage people from doing what I did all those years ago, getting a group of friends together to make a fun, low-budget project. If you had the budget and the time, you could actually have done this without all of these tools, but okay. you wouldn't have <laughs> because it would have been prohibitively expensive, right? But what you made, you could make another way. It's just you wouldn't have. It's just too time-consuming. But now, Right. I think you told me when we were talking the other day, these take you a couple of days to make at this point. So congrats, dude. You made three Wes Anderson parody videos in one month. You have officially killed this kind of thing forever. No one is ever gonna make one again. But beyond Wes Anderson parodies, because honestly, those should be over by now anyway, I worry that young aspiring filmmakers will see these and choose to use AI instead of actually going outside and putting their hands on a camera. And that, to me, is just depressing as hell. The funny thing about all this AI talk is that, really, none of this stuff actually is artificial intelligence. It's not thinking for itself. It is incapable of coming up with new ideas. This is machine learning. It's large language models. The idea behind each one of these programs is that they aggregate a ton of stuff that already exists and then regurgitate something similar. So when you open Midjourney and tell it to put an image in a Wes Anderson movie, it looks at a bunch of images of Wes Anderson movies and then does something that looks like an approximation of those. The Curious Refuge guy says that this is the same as artists having influences, that all artists borrow from other artists. So I am definitely more in the camp of the whole like steal like an artist uh, realm of thinking about creativity. And that idea is essentially that all of us are pulling our creative ideas from other inspiration in our past. We just don't, as humans, know uh, off the top of our head where those sources are coming from. Which I think is a pretty astounding misunderstanding of what artistic influence actually is. Artistic influence is Wes Anderson taking his love of Hal Ashby, Francois Truffaut, and Jacques Demy, and processing them into a unique approach that expresses his own view of the world. AI art is just a machine for plagiarizing existing art. This guy says that AI is democratizing storytelling. All of these tools are democratizing creativity. And making it possible for anyone to be a filmmaker. No. I'm sorry, but this is an insane take. Democratizing storytelling is what affordable filmmaking equipment did. It's what, like, iPhones did. It's what the internet did. Those things gave people, outside of traditional structures, without huge budgets and resources, the tools to create films and a free platform with which to reach a wide audience. Arguing for AI filmmaking is saying that people no longer need talent or skill. Like, by this logic, why would you learn to play the violin when you can use AI to create a fake violin recording of the piece of music that you want to play? The Curious Refuge website proudly says that they are, quote, empowering non-traditional artists, which is hilarious to me, because that is just another way of saying bad artists. It's like a steakhouse saying, we serve non-traditional meals, and then giving you a plate with a charred black hockey puck on it. AI filmmaking is a grift. It is a way to make something that looks professional without putting in any of the work to learn how to do it for real and without paying an actual cast or crew. Look, I'm not generally one for criticizing other folks on YouTube or starting feuds, and I wouldn't do it if I didn't think that this really, truly, genuinely sucks. 
And if the Curious Refuge people take offense to my comments, all I have to say is, you shouldn't. Because you didn't really make those videos. In that interview, you say that you didn't even come up with the idea itself. There is not a shred of personal expression or taste or humanity in there. I don't even know if this guy likes Wes Anderson movies. This is a machine suggestion for what would be a video that would get views on the internet. So I'm really only criticizing the work of a soulless program that is not alive, and I'm fine with that. After all, there is a good chance that my video from eight years ago is one of the sources that the AI pulled from to create these new ones. So if anyone is entitled to criticize it, it's me. And also Wes Anderson. It should be clear by now that I'm not really a fan of using AI to produce creative work, but this is not an entirely black and white situation. See, what we're calling AI is really just something trained on data sets to perform actions. And that kind of thing has been in use for years, and has some uses that I think are not just okay, but genuinely positive. There are several tools and programs like Adobe After Effects and Photoshop that meet this definition of AI. Like Rotobrush, a tool that detects objects and movement within a shot to automatically rotoscope. Or Content Aware Fill, which scans an image to remove a selected object and creates an extension of the background to fill that space. This is still technically AI, but here it's a tool meant to replace a tedious, repetitive process. It benefits creativity rather than replacing it, giving more time for artists to make actual creative choices. And this has been happening in the film industry for decades. One of the major technical breakthroughs on the original Lord of the Rings trilogy was the software Massive, developed by Steven Regulus at Weta Digital, which could create huge animated crowds with each character behaving individually with limited artificial intelligence, instead of requiring visual effects artists to animate every single digital person one by one. And more recently, the Spider-Verse movies used machine learning tools to replicate details, like cross-hatching or bende dots on characters' faces. And in instances like these, the tools are not replacing human jobs. Like Across the Spider-Verse reportedly had the largest crew of people of any animated movie in history. But again, this is a very, very slippery slope the slipperiest slope, perhaps, like a steep mountain covered in ice and banana peels and KY jelly, with a whole bunch of spikes and wolves and spike-covered wolves at the bottom. What seem like helpful tools used by talented artists can easily be abused by the executives at the top who want to increase profits. It's the same kind of thing that happened with the rise of robotics in the auto industry. And here we are arriving at a point where AI can and will start eliminating certain middle-class computer-based jobs. In the past few years, extensive research has been done into using AI to edit movie trailers. The idea is that you feed a full movie into the software, and it spits out a trailer based on its own learning of what kind of images and beats have been used in other trailers for successful films. Now this seems a lot more feasible than, like, creating a movie from scratch using AI. And you can argue that trailers aren't really art anyway. They're merely marketing tools, so who cares if they're automated? Other than, you know, the editors who make movie trailers and have jobs in that industry. But the thing about trailers is, there's still artistry in them. AI never would have made the choice to edit the trailer for The Social Network to a girls' choir cover of Creep or to cut the trailer for a serious man around the repeated rhythmic slamming of a man's head against a wall. These moments of actual innovation, the ones that create something that sticks with people for decades, can only be done by real human creativity. AI is improving all the time, but at its very best, you will only ever get serviceable imitations of mediocre products. But the question then is, do the people in charge care about that? Not to point fingers, but plenty of successful mainstream movies are merely mediocre recycled products. 
if a piece of software can create that automatically, do the shareholders care about giving up the potential for an amazing masterpiece? The current Writers Guild of America strike has been going on for about two months now, and one of the many issues the writers are striking over is AI, and the question of whether studios and production companies are going to try to use AI to replace human writers. As in, of course they're going to try. And the writers, obviously, don't want that. No one should want that. People who run movie studios, the David Zaslavs of the world, whose primary motives are usually to increase profits and please shareholders and drive up stock prices, are always looking for ways to eliminate risk. The major reason that the film industry has leaned so hard into franchises and IP is that making movies and TV based on familiar properties seems safer than an unknown original idea. And so you can see, to them, the appeal of AI. The whole idea of recycling and regurgitating existing things that have already proven commercially successful sounds great! What if you no longer had to deal with temperamental artists with their own perspectives who might make choices that turn out to be divisive? After all, how is this really all that different from Disney's ongoing line of live-action remakes of their animated movies? The great irony of this whole situation is that AI could also replace the people at the top. It was always the job of studio executives to decide what projects would get made. They were expected to have good business sense, like to know how best to spend their budget, but also good taste, so they could tell what might make good movies that would resonate with audiences and then make a profit. But in recent years, new AI software has been evolving that can, theoretically, determine how movies will perform commercially and what projects should be greenlit. In 2020, Warner Brothers signed a deal with a company called Synalytic to use their predictive analytics to help guide decision-making about what projects to greenlight. It can apparently determine the monetary value of different movie stars in different international territories to predict how a movie will perform. So hey, maybe the people we should really be worrying about are those poor executives with their $30 million salaries. I hope they're gonna be okay. The weird thing about making a video like this is that the story is evolving on a daily basis. Like, I was almost done writing this, and then the news broke that Secret Invasion, the new Marvel show on Disney+, Plus, used AI to create its opening title sequence. People immediately freaked out, since it seemed like what we were afraid of was happening sooner than we expected, and here it was the biggest studio on the planet doing it. But it's more complicated than that. See, Method Studios, the VFX company that designed the sequence, apparently did employ a team of designers and animators, and they claimed they used AI simply as a tool in the process, not as a means of replacing skilled human workers. Without knowing the step-by-step -step process, I guess we have to trust them on this? The director of the show is less helpful, saying that he doesn't really understand how the AI process works. Look, the fact is that this AI stuff is here, and it is not going away. And if we trust the people at Method Studios, this does seem like the ideal implementation of the technology, as merely another tool that skilled artists can use in their work. But the people who seem most excited about AI are not actually artists themselves. They are the tech bros who pay for a blue check mark on Twitter who view AI art as a win over those pretentious artists, and their dream is of a future where it can make movies tailored to their exact specifications, not like the shit Hollywood is making now. They love the idea of using AI for filmmaking because they don't actually have any talent or skill. For them, AI is like a cheat code that allows them to seem like actual artists without doing any actual work. The moral of this story is that AI art sucks. 
unless it's the Steven Spielberg film AI Artificial Intelligence, which is a masterpiece and everyone should go watch that instead of shitty plagiarized videos made by stupid pieces of software. See, the thing about AI art is that it isn't really art at all. Art, by its very definition, has to express some kind of human expression. This stuff generated by AI deserves a label that many of you know I really truly hate so much. This is content. Something utterly disposable, something meaningless. Content is such a nebulous term because it means everything and nothing. Patrick, and before we devolve into the most nebulous topic possible, maybe we could get in a word from our sponsor? Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Okay, so speaking of nebulous things, I'd like to tell you about Nebula. In my ongoing efforts to show that AI attempts at art are usually extremely bad, I decided to try another experiment and see what AI thinks a Patrick H. Willems video is like. So we made one, and by that I mean I had AI write it, and then I used their script to make the video. It turned out pretty much like you'd expect, but I think it's funny. But I couldn't really find a good place to fit it into this episode. See, all season long, for every episode, we've been releasing an extended cut on Nebula, the streaming platform I helped build, where you can also watch my feature-length film, Night of the Coconut, or my feature-length class on how to make a movie. So I decided that starting with this episode, instead of a Nebula-exclusive extended cut, each episode will have a Nebula-exclusive bonus companion mini-video, covering something that didn't quite make it into the main video. Plus, this way, if you tend to watch the videos on YouTube first, you will have no trouble finding the bonus stuff on Nebula. And I'm choosing to say bonus stuff, not bonus content, even though most people would. But anyway, what I'm getting at is that Nebula is the place where you can watch all of my regular videos, but with no ads, plus tons of amazing exclusive stuff that you can't get anywhere else. Also, if you're a fan of Jetlag the Game, new episodes drop there a week before they go on YouTube. Nebula is now the exclusive place where Lindsay Ellis releases new videos. And look, Nebula is a thing that I helped build alongside my friends, like Dave the Agent, and we've now got close to 700,000 paying subscribers and we're all really proud of it. And the cool thing is that right now, if you just click the link down there in the description, you can get 40% off of an annual subscription, which comes out to only $2.50 per month. That is, in my opinion, an incredible deal. And it doesn't just benefit you by giving you cool stuff to watch, it also helps support this channel and contributes to our ultimate goal, getting me out of debt, and one day, hopefully being able to afford a real desk not a plastic table. Nebula, watch good stuff, help Patrick get a desk. Okay, I think we got it. So the guy's name is Baker Dill, and he's a fisherman, and he's obsessed with catching a tuna fish. And the tuna fish is named Justice, and he, uh, I'm gonna put you on hold. <sighs> Nothing like a nice Aperol spritz after a hard day at the office, huh? You know there's more to an Aperol spritz than just Aperol, right? Tart. Do you need something? Yeah, I felt like this episode could use an epilogue. You know, where we sum up what we learned today, sprinkle in a few dumb gags. Can you tag in your roommate for this? Well, I would, but Chloe's busy writing a musical about her life. Well, that's interesting. Basically, I'm just looking for someone to powwow with. Oh, I don't think we're supposed to say that anymore. Tara, could you check on that? I'm on it. Look, when I got here today, all I wanted was to make a nice two-hour video about Tom Cruise's hair. And then I got caught up trying to solve the whole problem of AI art. How's that going? Not great, Dave. Turns out, AI is just the latest tool for lazy, greedy people to exploit artists in the ongoing march toward everything becoming that thing I hate so much, my least favorite word in the world. Here it comes. Content. Yeah. A term so broad as to render it utterly meaningless. Yeah, I know. Patrick, I've heard this speech. If you hate the word so much, maybe this is the wrong line of work for you. People are gonna say it, you're not gonna get them to stop saying it. If you want my advice, and you should, drop it. Roll the credits and do your Tom Cruise hair video. No, you know what? Thomas's feathery updos can wait. This 
is more important. I'm gonna take on content, show the world how evil it really is. Dave the Agent, I think we got our new series on our hands. Patrick complains. Patrick, what is rule number one here at Nebula? No villain arcs? No villain arcs! We've been through this before, we know how it ends. So maybe more like, Patrick gives an impassioned plea, like Jimmy Stewart and Mr. Smith goes to Washington? I think that could work. All right, done. This has been a very productive little chat. All right, Emma, roll cameras. We're taking on the whole system. You still there? Yeah. No, I had to do a thing to set up the next episode. Some meta thing. I don't know why he makes this so complicated. Anyway, so his ex-wife shows up and her new husband is a real piece of shit. Hello and welcome to the end of the video. You made it, you made it all the way through, congratulations. And what you just saw up there on the screen, uh, next time content, uh, it's not a joke, that is really happening. Uh, we're making the content video. If you've ever spoken to me in person, or especially like if you follow me on Twitter, you're aware that I have a long-standing beef with the word content when used to describe creative work. I don't like it, and I've been threatening for years to make a video about why I don't like calling things content, and, um, and I finally reached the point where I was like, let's do it. Now is the time. We got, we gotta, gotta get it out there. I, I can't wait any longer. And, uh, yeah, I think it's gonna be a fun one. It's gonna be a bit different than usual. It's not, you know, about, like, specific movies. Uh, and the script is almost done, which is great. Um, yeah, these, we're, we've got, like, a loose, maybe, kinda, sorta series forming, the, like, a... A few videos we're working on are all, like, thematically connected. And, uh, like, this AI one, this is way more topical than we ever really get with the videos. So I kept getting stressed out while working on it, being like, is this still going to be relevant by the time uh, the video is done? Will it be old news by then? And, um, no, AI is still constantly in the news. So I, I think I think it's still relevant. Um, I hope you, you enjoyed it. Um, I wish I could have tied in stuff about the new Mission Impossible movie, uh, because... That is, uh, that has, that also has a big beef with AI. So anyway, um, look, if you want to, you know, get your name in these credits here, you know, scrolling up and help support the channel, uh, you can join the Patreon, uh, all the money the Patreon brings in, you know, goes toward, like, funding the videos and paying the team that works on them. You also get access to, like, our little monthly Patreon streams. On the last one, I told the, the whole full in-depth story about Mission Impatsible and how you know, how it actually all came together in the end. Um, and they're fun. We hang out, you know. I edit while, while we, we do them. Anyway, I think we're at the end now. I should wrap this up. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.